to join as we go. First of all, we very much appreciate everyone for being here today. We are super positive that this is going to be very, very um, useful for you all. Everyone that is looking to learn more about Agile, we, we will uh, share all the knowledge from a, a special guest speakers here tonight. So first of all, I would like to give a quick intro to Symbiosis, our company. We're building a marketplace that helps other tech companies in the US to source talent from Latin America. So if you're looking to hire developers, you can use our platform to find them, bet them, hire them, and pay them all in one place. So without further ado, I would like to, to ask our special guest speakers, Ed and Brendan, to share more about themselves. Could you give us a quick intro? Let me take like a top to on this. <laughs> so okay. we're Tulsa Agile Practitioners. We are a user group who, as you might guess from the name, is interested in agility and the various forms of it, which Ed will be giving a good 30-minute presentation about uh, a little bit. We've been in Tulsa for, I think, nearly a decade now. Um, I've been the primary leader for maybe about three years, and Ed has just joined on along with uh, Derek as our triumvirate of co-leadership. Uh, for 2023. And Matt, this is a really great turnout. Um, I met Omar um, at, it was some tech event uh, in Tulsa. There was just no, a, a lucky, um, no, uh, what's the thing? Um, serendipity? Yeah, yeah that's right the right word. <laughs> so we just yeah. had, you know, talking about like, that's, you know, people in the startup space, like a lot of the people that uh, Tulsa has, uh, Tulsa Agile has talked about, do you have the idea that you need to be agile, but we, a lot of people don't understand what agility actually is. So this is where this collaboration sprung up from. And Ed, I've stolen a lot of the oxygen out of, out of this room. <laughs> but, uh, you go ahead and give your little intro. Uh, yeah, so I'm Ed Schaefer. Uh, I'm an agile coach. I, I moved to Tulsa about six months ago. And prior to that, I was in the Denver Agile and DevOps community. So I've, I've been uh, the, part of the Agile Denver Kanban community of practice. For a number of years and, and also worked with the um, ad, uh, Denver DevOps group. So um, yeah, I've been working with teams uh, for about 15 years in different capacities, um, not just software development teams, but um, all sorts of different teams and, and organizations. And uh, I just really love Agile. So I'm really happy here that we're here today to be able to, to talk with y'all and, and hopefully you'll learn something and, and be able to take something back. Sounds great. And we very much appreciate it. So we can start uh, right now. If you want to share uh, the presentation, that would be that would be great. Deb. And everybody, yeah, so whatever questions you have, drop them into the chat, and we'll be yeah. working on prioritizing them for after. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to not look at the chat while we go because it'll just yeah, distract no. me. That's my job. My job. So uh, pop them in there, and and we'll we'll do those towards the end. And this is um, not a super formal presentation, but wanted to just give some context and and sort of uh, make sure that we're all on the same page and. Um, uh, kind of have the same same language that we're using here. So uh, the first thing I wanted to open this up with is a, a quote that I love that I use all the time from a, a statistician named George E.P. Box. Um, and he says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, and I think this is a really important way to open things up because everything we're going to be looking at tonight is really different types of models, uh, models for thinking, models for working, models for approaching problems. Um, and none of them are going to be uh, perfect in every situation. And none of them, I, I would say none of them are, are exactly right 100% of the time, um, but they are all useful and they are, uh, they all can be useful in different ways, sometimes in combination, sometimes independently. Um, uh, and so, you know, I, I think that's just a, a thing that's really important for us to keep in mind when we look at different tools and ways of working um, is they're all models and they all are going to have things that are wrong with them, but they can be use, useful still. Um, so the first model that we're going to just look at here before we dive into some some kind of more traditional agile um, is this from Adventures with Agile, and it's this idea of kind of the the different components that go into how we think about things. Um, and so on the the right hand side, you can see that we're we're measuring things from what's highly visible um, to what is intangible, and we're saying that things that are highly visible um, are less powerful, and things that are more intangible can be very powerful. 
But because they're highly visible, uh, those are dy more dynamic and they're easier to change. And so as a result, they're more likely to change often, which we see on the left-hand side. And as we get to the more intangible things, kind of those bigger things, they typically change less often. Um, and so when we look at this model, we can see there's tools and processes kind of in the very middle. And those are the easiest things for us to change and, and uh, uh, try with a team um, and see what kind of results we get. Um, and those tools and processes are all related to kind of that, that bigger picture of practices. Um, and then those practices are all foundationally built on principles, uh, which then have values behind them. And then the overarching picture is a, is a mindset. Um, and so ultimately, when we talk about agility and, and being agile, we're really wanting to have that mindset. We want people to think in a way that, that kind of supports agility. Um, but in order to get there, it's very difficult to change mindset. Um, and it's very difficult to just change someone's values or principles. So if we introduce some tools and processes and some practices, that can be a way to sort of instigate that change and eventually have that mindset change. And so that's, that's, uh, that's the main reason why when we talk about agility and agile and even DevOps, a lot of the times we talk a lot about tools and processes and practices, and it becomes harder to uh, like people, people focus a lot on those and they focus less on the principles and values and mindset. And the reason is because they're more visible and they're more easy to sort of use and interact with and experiment with. Um, but we need to remember that, that those by themselves are not enough to get us where we're trying to go, um, you know, as, as far as uh, having a mindset that, that allows us to, to work in a, in a more agile way. So um, we want to talk a little bit about the background um, of agile and we'll, we'll kind of get into uh, where, where this term came from. Um, if we go back to like the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, there was a bunch of different practices and tools uh, that, that, and approaches that people were trying. One of them is this one, DSDM. And so these are the principles that were for DSDM. Focus on the business need, deliver on time, cooperate and collaborate, never compromise quality, build incrementally, communicate continuously, develop iteratively, and demonstrate control. So just look at this picture and kind of think about these and, and uh, remember uh, sort of high level what, what the, the, the sort of um, tone is of, of these, because we're going to see kind of a, a pattern as we keep going here. Another really popular framework that was kind of growing at this time that people were using was the Crystal framework. Um, this says the Crystal Agile framework, but it wasn't called Agile back then. It was just called the Crystal framework because Agile didn't exist yet. Um, and this one, the, the main components of this were frequent delivery, osmotic communication, which is, uh, if you're not familiar with that word, it's like communicating so much that everybody just kind of understands what's going on. It's almost like it's bleeding out of my brain and into your brain and you just know uh, what's happening. Uh, personal safety, which is kind of like a, a psychological safety sort of thing, like feeling safe in your work, um, having focus on the work, um, having access to subject matter experts and users, and then having a, a strong technical environment. Um, and then the bottom part was kind of showing how you would change the crystal based on how many people there were that, that were kind of working on a, on a team or uh, together. So again, kind of look at those and think about, and I'll, I'll even go back in a second, but think about what you see here. And here was those DSDM ones again. So then another one that existed before the word agile was a thing was Scrum. Scrum came to be kind of in the 80s and 90s. It wasn't super popular. People didn't use it all of the time. Um, but, and it wasn't like the number, what do they say now? It's the number one agile framework in the world or something. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't any of those things. It was like a handful of teams, maybe at a couple of companies were using it, uh, but they have a bunch of values. Their values are courage, focus, commitment, respect, and openness. And not only do they have some values, they have some principles as well. And their, their key principles are control over empirical process. So that's using scientific management basically, or, or scientific uh, empirical process basically to um, approach things. And then self-organization, collaboration, value-based prioritization, time boxing, and iterative development. And then the biggest, uh, kind of most popular framework at the time was XP or extreme programming. 
Um, and XP, it has its own values, communication, simplicity, feedback, courage, and respect. And with that, it comes with a bunch of principles. Take baby steps, focus on flow, reflection, improvement, mutual benefits, redundancy, and failure. So all the people who had worked together uh, or who, who had worked independently and come up with DSDM and Crystal and Scrum and XP, they came together. Um, and you may have heard this story before. It was 2001 and they came together in Snowbird, Utah and they were skiing. Mm. And uh, while they were there, they decided they were going to have like this this conversation because they all knew they were doing uh, similar ways of working um, and they were trying to solve these problems in software development. And, and you know, the big problem was we're going to plan everything up front and then and then after that, we're going to hand it over and develop it. And then after we develop it, we'll test it and then we'll give it to the business and it'll be it'll be perfect, right? Because we planned it and then we built it and then we give it to them. So everything will be great, but it wasn't, it wasn't working out like that for anybody. And that's why they were coming up with these different approaches and, and, and focusing on things like flow and improvement and respect. And, uh, you know, they, they wanted to find better ways to work. And so what did they do? They spent like a couple of days locked in some rooms together, debating about the terminology, and they came up with the manifesto for agile software development. Uh, and this is just a screenshot straight from the, the webpage. I, Honestly, I pull this web page up all the time, just as little reminders for myself. Um, and so the main manifesto says, we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value in our individuals and interactions over process and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. And then they say that is while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. And then behind those, uh, these four values, there's 12 principles. So they say satisfy the customer by delivering software early. And it's not just any software, it's valuable software. We welcome changing requirements and we, we don't just welcome them, but we use uh, change. To, to find a way to give our, our customers a competitive advantage. We need to deliver free, uh, software frequently. Um, and we prefer a shorter time scale because we are giving them something valuable and we're able to get feedback more quickly. Business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. We need to have those subject matter experts there so we can get the information that we need. We wanna build them around, uh, the projects around motivated individuals and then give them what they need and tr give them trust so they get the job done. So it's kind of that respect. Most efficient and effective method is, of communication is face-to-face -face conversation. We measure with working software. We promote sustainable development. We should be able to do this indefinitely. We shouldn't speed up and slow down or uh, you know, feel like we're hitting roadblocks or getting burned out. We need to have continuous attention to technical excellence. This is always my favorite one is simplicity. The art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. Sometimes maybe we can get away with doing a little less and still get the value we're looking for. The best architectures, requirements, and designs come from self-organizing teams. And at regular intervals, we, the team reflects on how to become more effective and then tune and adjust accordingly. So you can see where a lot of this came from. Like they were already doing a lot of these pieces and then they kind of pulled it together to give this more holistic, bigger picture framework for software development. So where does this take us, right? So this, this kind of, uh, this is like 2001 and this in a lot of ways is a turning point. Um, this, is, this is when Agile really starts to blow up and you know people talk about Agile a lot. Now there's more training and certifications and all sorts of things. Um, so what's, what's kind of popular today and what's, what do we look at going forward? Well, Scrum is still extremely popular. I'm not going to put those slides um, again, but but you know we've looked at that, and that one's still more people are using that than than really anything else. Um, another one now this really or, originates more from uh, Lean um, and like the Toyota production system, which is is sort of a um, where the the ones that we've already looked at in Agile they're kind of one pathway, and Lean it sort of has some maybe some little information that trickled in, but it's almost a a parallel path that you'll see winds up unifying. Um, in, in a moment here, um, but Kanban uh, comes from, from Lean and they have agendas. So they say we want sustainability, 
um, which is very similar to what we saw in the Agile Manifesto. They have a service orientation and then survivability. They've got these values of transparency, balance, collaboration, customer focus, flow, leadership, understanding, agreement, and respect. And they've got some principles that are really interesting. Um, in Kanban, they say change management is start with what you do now and then agree uh, to pursue in, uh, evolutionary change and have everyone uh, at all or levels of organization uh, provide leadership. Um, and also they say focus on the customer needs and expectations. And then that's that self-organization again around people managing the work um, and focusing on delivery. So where the Agile and, uh, and Lean really come together is when we get to DevOps, which has really become more popular since about 2008 or so. Um, and DevOps really is the evolution of the Agile practices on the software development side um, and sort of the Lean uh, concepts for manufacturing being applied to operations. Um, and there's a few frameworks that, uh, and models that we use when we talk about DevOps. First one is this one here, culture, automation, lean, measurement and sharing, or the CALMS acronym. DevOps also has this one, which is the three ways. The first way of DevOps is systems thinking. So you think about the whole system from end to end, not just the individual pieces, um, amplify feedback loops, um, and then a culture of continual experimentation and learning. There's also the five ideals of DevOps, which say locality and simplicity, focus, flow, and joy, improvement of daily work, psychological safety, and customer focus. Um, and I think it, to, to me, when I look at these components of DevOps, I really see um, everything that came before Agile, the things in the Agile manifesto, and then some of those things that we looked at from Kanban practices, you know, really all coming together to be kind of this holistic approach um, for having effective ways of working, um, for helping people find satisfaction in their work, um, for focusing on the flow of the work and delivering value, um, and making sure that it's that that uh, the, the you know the work that we do um, helps people, and and we work in communities and we spread that learning and that knowledge that we can really accomplish great things. Another framework or, or, or kind of approach that's sort of adjacent to agile, and I've been finding it to be really useful um, in in a lot of the practices, um, is the is domain driven design. Um, and where this is a little bit different, um, but in, in a lot of ways, it does still focus on how we communicate with each other and making sure that we have that shared understanding. And in domain-driven design, there's, there's kind of four big concepts there. The first is that we focus on the core domain. What's the context that we're working on? Let's make sure we understand it and how it's used. Um, then we explore that domain using models. Um, so we, we create models and we use that. And, and similar to why I have all these visualizations here, uh, we use those models to help us talk about it and make sure we understand what we're, we're uh, looking at. Um, you know, it'd be really hard to, if you've never seen a map of the world and I said, point to France, you wouldn't even know where to start. Uh, but if I give you a model, a map of the earth um, and give you some context about where France is, then you'll be able to, to understand better, uh, you know, where to point. And so that's kind of why we use models. Um, they also have the concept of ubiquitous language. So this means that we create a uh, language that we all understand and when we, uh, when we talk about different parts of a business, sometimes language means different things in different parts of a business. Um, so we understand that. And then that way that helps us communicate with each other better. Um, and then lastly, it's about continuous improvement. We're always looking to improve our knowledge of the domain, the models that we're using and the language that we use to talk about it. Now, Agile is not just for software development. Um, one example I wanna give is Agile marketing. Um, and there is a separate Agile marketing manifesto that's been created. Um, and so it's very similar conceptually to the software development one, but it's been tweaked a little bit to focus more on the types of work that marketing does. Uh, but ultimately it's about adopting new ways of working to be able to respond with, uh, to the speed and complexity of the, the way the world is. Uh, it's about focusing on customer value, delivering early and often, learning through experiments, having collaboration, um, and responding to change. And then they also have some principles. Um, and they, these are really you know, closely aligned with everything else we've looked at. Alignment, transparency, uh, looking for different points of view, um, enhancing, uh, embracing change, um, prioritizing work, uh, you know, learn from failures, organize um, in small groups, build programs around people who, who are motivated and trust them, 
um, sustainable pace and uh, you know, making sure that we, we focus on excellence. And then lastly, simplicity, that one's in there as well. And I think for me, uh, the way I kind of want to just close this out um, before we open it up for questions and a discussion is, I think you know, sometimes people will say, what is the most important value in the Agile Manifesto? Or what's the most important principle in the Agile Manifesto? And I say it's not the values or the principles that's most important. I think it's that very first line. We are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. And really that's to me is what Agile boils down to, is looking for better ways of doing things and then helping others find better ways of doing things um, and sharing what you learn with other people as well. So with that, we'll, we'll turn it over for Q&A. Ed, we very much appreciate this. This is very, very interesting. And uh, it adds a lot of value to the audience. And I would like to just uh, follow up uh, with this, with this uh, last thought. For first time founders, some of our attendees here today, this is the first time that they're building a tech company. What would you say is the best way for them to get started with the Agile methodology and learn more about Scrum and everything? So what would be like the first thing they have to do? Ooh, um, well, the first thing I would recommend doing, um, if you already have a process, some sort of thing like process in place, or, or you're already doing something as a team developing something, um, I would recommend visualizing that um, and mapping that that flow. So this is really a starting practice from Kanban. Um, but if you don't have your work visualized, it's really hard to keep track of and know what you're doing and if you're doing too much or not enough and if you're managing a sustainable flow. Um, so yeah, for me, that would be the, in the simplest way, just put up a, on a whiteboard or, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a bureau or something, do a to-do, doing and done, and then put sticky notes for the items that you know about. Um, and then you can represent that. And I would, that would be my very first step. Um, right. If you're really interested in something like Scrum, if you think you need a, a framework, um, for Scrum, I would go out and read the Scrum guide. It's very simple. Um, there's not a lot of complexity to it. Um, if you start with the Scrum guide, if you read other people's blogs, it'll get very difficult and complex very fast. Okay. They'll add all, all the extra things on. Um, and then I would try setting up the, um, the cadence with the event. So uh, set up on a two week, monthly or one week cycle, whatever you wanna try. Uh, do you set up a planning, um, set up daily standups, um, set up a review and then a retrospective um, and, and probably get a facilitator if you're not sure how to do those things. Um, and, and then they can you know, and kind of walk through the process a few times mm -hmm. um, and doing that, that learning iteration will help you learn kind of the, the most. Okay, 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 that's, that's great. And one other question that I have on, on that same uh, thought is that, um, what, what do you think um, it, that the impact was from for remote work? I mean, like, you know, like there have been new companies everywhere now. People are hiring uh, talent in different countries, different cities. So do you think that Agile actually enhanced this, uh, these remote teams to work like better, more efficiently? What was the impact? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So um, when I was first introduced to uh, working on, on an Agile team in like a, a really Agile way and, and had the, the words to describe it and, and not just kind of experimenting with different, different things, um, I was working with a, a, a team that was based out of India. And prior to doing sort of a, a Scrum-based workflow, um, it was very much, uh, I worked with some business partners who would write up the requirements. Um, I would then sort of translate that into more technical requirements and send it to India. Um, and then it would take, they would work on it and we might check in once a week or something and they'd say, everything's good and we're, we're working on it. And then six months or eight months or a year later, they'd say it's done. And then I'd get it and I'd have to help test everything. Um, and then we could give it to our business partners. And uh, there was always defects and it was, it was always really difficult. Um, we, we started, we moved over to Scrum. And so, and that, that was an organizational mm -hmm. mandate. Uh, I might not have chosen that in that mm -hmm. context, but that was what we were asked to do. Um, and what that, that changed for us is that we were now meeting every single day. 
uh, we were planning um, every two weeks and we were adjusting our plan based on the business's needs. So it was no longer, we're working on this huge thing and it's gonna take us six months or a year. Um, it was now we're gonna work on these small chunks of, of value. Um, and as the business had needs that changed or um, in that context, it was a, a regulatory, um, it was a, a compliance and legal environment. So there was regulatory changes that would come out. And in the old way of working, it was very hard to pivot and then do those regulatory things and get them done in time. Um, but now we were able to make those adjustments whenever they came up. Um, so sometimes the work was still hard, but at least we were doing whatever was most important okay. for, for our business partners. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. To that. Yeah. Sort of the great difficulty with remote work is communication. When you're face-to-face, -face, um, a lot of our naturally evolved ways of communicating comfortably, they're right there. Whereas with you know, remote uh, teleconferences, sometimes there's just these little in, uh, inconsistencies and inefficiencies that the brain kind of gets stressed out about. That's where Zoom fatigue comes from. But agility values frequent communication over documentation. For each team, it's going to vary what tools and what processes work the best for them. And the only way of really arriving at that effectively is just to continually inspect and adapt your own processes um, and listen to your people as you bring on new people and say your company is growing. That's going to be a strain that you will need to manage. Uh, it will fall on leadership. It's up to you to figure out how to make sure that the people are able to work comfortably and have effective communications. I can't give you any quick prescription. I don't think anybody can, um, but you, you commit to the principles. And if you make the organization agile, not just the software development, and this is probably the biggest thing we have run into over the years with TAP is people thinking that it's just about, we do stand-ups or we have a backlog or this, that, the other thing. We have these artifacts or process that must make us agile. No, it's just like the adjective agile, agility, being agile in how you do stuff. Um, being able to hit what you're after in a flexible way and changing requirements uh, is the way you do things. And working remote, you're going to have special challenges. There's a lot of people out there. Nate has dropped a great resource. And there's a lot of people who've been talking about how to manage the challenges of work from home and remote work. Um, and you'll just have to leverage those and figure out what is going to work for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a great insight. Yeah, please. Yeah, well, something else that kind of... Uh, made me think of is when we talk about like agile leadership um, or agile leaders, I think one of the most important qualities is having some self-awareness and being able to reflect on what you're actually doing. Um, there's, there's this book that I really love called The Delicate Art of Bureaucracy. And in it, he, uh, he, he, basically, he basically says that for human beings, it's, it's really easy for us to come up with bureaucratic solutions to problems because you know if if, uh, if we have something hanging on the wall that people take and it's not there when I need it the easiest solution for me to come up with is a sign out a, a sign out sheet so that I know who has it and when they're returning it um, but an even simpler solution would be to go ask who has it and say I need it or for the person who took it to put it back promptly when they're done with it right and so um, you know, I, th I think that it's, and that, that's one of the, it's actually one of the funny problems with something like Scrum is that a lot of organizations will go, we're having a problem, we can't deliver, or we're not delivering, whatever, whatever their reason is for going agile, and they'll say, let's do, let's do Scrum, let's put all of this overhead on, on teams and change their ways of working, and that'll solve our problems, um, and, and it doesn't, right, because the problem isn't the, the, the way of working, the problem is, you know, ultimately the way they communicate and, and the way that they focus on the right problem. Very, very interesting. And now that we have seen uh, this process for how we have been building software products for the last decades and how it's been changing now, how do you envision for the next 10 years that this is gonna change now? Wow. 10 years uh, in the world that we live in, I think it's difficult to even forecast out five, but I mean, <laughs> the far future, um, yeah. whatever number of years. Um, I feel like we, so earlier in uh, in TAP's life, our our main thing was sort of proselytizing for, ag for agile, We're trying to get more organizations to do agile. Um, and now it's basically to the point where everybody knows, oh, we must be agile. 
they don't know what agile is and that's mm -hmm. kind of the the new challenge to focus on i think it's going to continue to be difficult because mindset and culture are difficult to change they're very nebulous you can't pin them down and say they are exactly this thing they fit in this box they have these uh qualities and criteria it's always going to be loosey-goosey um so it's always going to be difficult to work with and the most difficult thing is if you've done it right how do you know that you've really done it like um there's there's not like it's not like a video game where it's like you you get an achievement and oh i know i've done the thing for sure um there's you could always do agile better there's always a better way of delivering uh software a better way of communicating um so it's I think going to continue to be like that in the future. Um, I don't know that technology is going to radically change that because this is largely a human problem. How do we work together well? How do we unlock that power that uh, is a force multiplier of us collaborating to do more than we ever could just as the sum of our individual contributions alone? Um, and that's a special kind of magic uh, that people have always been chasing I've always been trying to find to work better for them. Um, and you basically can just you know look to the experience of others, see what applies to you, make the best use of it that you can, um, and have fun. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Ed, would you like to share uh, more on that? Yeah, I mean, I guess um, the Agile Manifesto was created more than 20 years ago now. And there's still lots of organizations that are struggling with these, these challenges or are doing things the, the, the kind of the old way or, um, you know, waterfall with agile terminology or, or, or something. So I, I suspect that the future is not going to look that much different than today with the, uh, with the exception being that I, I think that some of the more agile organizations um, that are, are coming up that are able to disrupt some of those those big bohemoth uh, or, uh, companies and and uh, in industries, um, you know, do have a chance of overtaking them, um, because I've I've worked at a large financial institution. I have uh, I've, I've talked with a bunch of people working in a large healthcare institution who are doing like the, you know large scale agile and things like that. And and uh, uh, while things are better for them than it was without any. Agile, having those big organizations with all of that top-down leadership and, and all of that, um, it is an uphill battle. And there's a lot of resistance um, and, and a lot of, of bureaucracy and red tape that prevents those types of companies from becoming true, like true business agility organization. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's a term that's growing a lot more as business agility. It used to just be like software agility. And now it's all about business agility and that the whole organization needs to be like that. So I, I think companies that can do that successfully and have agile marketing and agile HR and, and everything else, and that they're all working together cohesively um, in that way, they're going to have a, a, a big leg up um, mm -hmm. because they're going to be able to respond to the market a, a lot a lot more easily. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. I would like to remind our audience that you can share your questions through the chat so we can read it out loud. And also questions or comments are welcome. So now um, we'd like to ask uh, Brendan, if you'd like to read the first question that we have from Julian uh, out loud, and if you can share any thoughts on that uh, regarding the flow, uh, that would be great. Yeah, I've been thinking about that. I'm pretty sure that uh, what Ed is talking about is basically the flow of work rather than the very wonderful psychological state of flow in which you kind of don't notice that you're working, you're just really enjoying it so well. Um, I I understand it that way, Ed. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. And I I just wanted to see the the question just to to make sure I had the, yeah. the right. Comment. Yeah. So, so flow would be um, great so to flow. understand a little bit more about what flow means in this context to give you no know, uh, Julian's question to do airing as I was asked to do rather than just extemporize. Yeah. Definitely. So yeah, in this context, flow would be. Um, I, I use it in the in the kind of traditional lean or, or Kanban sense of um, basically how long does it take from the moment something enters into the beginning of your work stream to it and coming out of your work stream and making sure that it's not um, not being stopped um, or or being delayed as it goes through. So kind of that 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 
uh, that timing um, from entry to exit um, and having that be sort of a, a smooth process. Okay, uh, that's great. And there's another comment. Uh, as a project manager from, from Paula, as a project manager, the thing that worked best for me was to ask each team leader, what can I do better to ensure your success? Believe me, they will tell you. <laughs> so yeah, what was your opinion on that? Bit? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's great. I actually asked a similar, I, I'm on a new uh, project uh, recently and I'm just meeting with the team members and that was one of the, the questions I was asking them today was, was first was, you know, what, what is previous uh, like leaders and, and coaches in this position done that you liked and what have they done that you didn't like um, that I can maybe try to work around those things. And then it was, what can I do to, to best support you and, and help you, um, you know, uh, succeed and, and accomplish your goals. So um, yeah, I think those are great questions and, and something that I almost always um, ask when I'm, when I'm in that, that sort of a position with folks. Yeah. Yeah. I can relate in college, there's a great organization called Leadership. They also have a very good brand name, uh, but uh, they had a retreat uh, during, uh, during college and there was an exercise that we did that was, we were basically an assembly line and the process was just handing tennis balls from one person to the next in order um, to make sure that everybody got a hand on the ball, literally. Mm -hmm. And the facilitators kept on introducing various interruptions. Um, no, uh, simulate labor strike or various uh, requirements to do things. My team won, but uh, <clears throat> a large part of that was that I was asking everybody, you know, like, you know, what was working, what was helping you. Um, and if you give people agency in the work process that they are, again, shedding so much of their family time each day to participate in, mm -hmm. and they have their, you know, commitment and ambition to see the organization grow as well in those cases, um, they will gladly participate. And Paul is absolutely right on that. Okay, that's that's very, very impressive. And it's a, it's a very good experience, right? You see, when you have it like in early days and you're able to actually apply that knowledge into your team, into your, that's that's great. We have one comment uh, from Crystal. Yes, um, yes, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> Would you like to read it, Brendan? Sure, I, I think she makes great points. Um, I think remote work is the exact reason being agile is needed, being able to adapt. And I haven't done a whole lot of Zoom calls myself being a solopreneur, so a uh, different situation. I, um, to, I do not find there is an issue with my team not being in the room face-to-face. -face. Zoom allows people to be face-to-face -face if needed from anywhere. I think this is really good. I actually think seeing people at home instead of an office creates a more intimate team. Uh, Three, you measure by the success of delivering a product that the customer wants. I mean, absolutely. If you're going to work mm. in your pajamas, who cares? As long as you get the work done. If you get the work done in less hours, who cares? You got the work done. Um, four, I think we will continue to see Agile grow as companies see other companies use Agile successfully. That's great. Those are very, very great insights, Crystal. Thanks for sharing. And we have... Yeah, no Thing I might I would want to add a, a caveat to I would say is I do agree Zoom allows people to be face to face from anywhere, um, and I do agree that seeing people's home offices or like their kids are picking up their dog I lo I love that and I think that is great. Uh, all of that being said, I do I after having been remote now in a couple of positions um, and and working with different folks I do think that finding opportunities to get your team together in person is very important. Um, if you're in a in a fully remote work environment, maybe it's once a quarter, maybe it's maybe it's once every six months. That might be less frequently than you'd like, um, but there is something about getting face to face, like in person, and seeing someone in three dimensions uh, that creates like a level. Like right now. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. No, but it, it, it carries <laughs> a level of connection that will carry forward into those Zoom calls and into that remote work environment where sometimes when you've never met someone in person, um, you can get the wrong impression. I remember at a previous job, there was someone I, like we had an okay relationship, but I just always felt like he didn't like me that much. And then we met in person and I was like, oh, he doesn't, this is, there's no problem here whatsoever. And it made all of our Zoom calls in the future much better. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I think there's, 
I don't ever want to go back to the office full time, but I don't, I think there's no substitute for meeting people in person um, and being able to take that good energy back to the, the remote work. I have seen that actually some of the companies uh, have been uh, having like after office, right, with the team. And sometimes they go to a bar, to a restaurant, more like an um, unofficial a meeting or something like that that helps people to bond and actually to connect with each other. And I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Ed. Um, that's great. So we have a one last comment uh, here. Uh, Ed, would you like to read that one? From yeah, so it looks yeah. like it's a question. Actually. What's the common pattern of resistance experienced in agile transformation projects? Oh, okay. Oh, this is a this is an excellent question. Um, So every change is going to be different, and every organization is is probably going to have its its own things. But from everything I've seen, and and um, I, I talk to a lot of folks and a lot of organizations to understand their successes and their failures and and their challenges. Um, and I would say that the the thing about agile transformation projects is that they are almost always um, a, a change that is being forced on someone, right? So if I choose to change, great, right? It's my choice. So I'm all for it. I'm going to go through that process and, and I'm all about it. But if someone is telling, telling me I have to change, then there can be resistance and there can be churn. Um, so the, the pattern that I've seen, and I wish I had a, a slide ready to go to, to show you this and everything, but the pattern I've seen the most is the, the Virginia Satir change uh, curve. Um, and it's a curve that I'll, I'll do it. I think you guys are backwards for me. So I'll do it from this side where... <laughs> shows that you have you have the status quo and then you introduce a change and it creates this kind of dip and then and then there's sort of like some chaos and some frustration and then you need to find a way to kind of climb out of that dip and create a new status quo and then you can kind of kind of keep keep moving along um and so a, a couple things that you can do um in regards to that is um you can try to make that dip smaller so if you make the changes smaller um, and easier for people to swallow, then that can make those, the, you kind of do a bunch of small changes instead of one big change. That can be a, a kind of one way to overcome that. Um, and then the other, there, there's a, a, John Cotter is a, a change guru. He's written like a million books on change. I have a whole bunch of them on my shelf, but he has these eight steps um, to dealing with change. And those, as, at least conceptually to think about, um, it, it, it's basically about you create a, a sense of urgency around the change and then you find people who are going to help you drive the change um, and then and then you kind of take some additional steps to work through the change and that can help make that curve a little bit more more shallow um, and then the last thing I'll mention just because I this is one of my favorite tools uh, there, there's a, a set of tools called lean change management um, and the basic idea behind that is that we visualize all of our changes um, and we get we're no longer uh, forcing change on people we co-create change with the people who are going to be going through the change. So if we tell them why we need the change and what outcomes that we're looking for and what we're hoping to accomplish by making this change, then we can bring them along on that journey and they can help us help us work through that change instead of it being like a, a painful process for them to go through. I love change management. If anybody needs help with change management, <laughs> yeah. call, I'll, I'll be there for you. <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. Ed. And any last thoughts that you would like to share on, on this topic for, for the audience? No, we've got another question. Now. Oh, really? Yeah, Narab asked, but change uh, management is part of waterfall, right? Like training the trainers. And I would say it, a given thing can be part of multiple different practices. So I, I'm not super familiar with, uh, with waterfalls, internal artifacts and, and uh, anatomy. But I would have to imagine in the generic sense, managing change would have to happen inside of any type of organization. Um, so it's just going to function differently. So I would imagine that in a waterfall organization, when you're doing change management, you're doing all the research all up front, you're doing all the analysis up in front, you're coming up with all the conclusions, you're coming up with all the documentation, and what you're presenting is like Athena bursting from Zeus's head. It's fully formed, um, there is no growth period, it's, it's never a kid, it's just fully adult and completely uh, divine and supposed to be perfect, and that just doesn't really work in real life. I would have to imagine, especially when you're dealing with change, and people, 
it's, it's it can't ever go the way that you expect it to. I mean, you can't even get onto uh, a video call or a presentation and your AV equipment will behave the way it's supposed to. It, it instantly tries to break on you because it knows it's showtime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it happens all the time, right? Like all, all the time. Yeah. So um, in, in that case, um, any any last, last thoughts that you would like to share as a word of you to our audience? We, we can um, also think about uh, these early stage funders that are building these companies for the first time. So we know that you, you, you went through that process. So any things that you would like to share? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess the last thoughts that I'd like to leave you with is um, I think that everything we do is agile when you really think about it, right? You, you might wake up and make a plan for the day and then your kid gets sick and you have to leave work early or and figure out how to pick them up and get them home or you know the something the, the fridge went out and now you don't have dinner and you have to figure it out and so we're, we're constantly responding to change um and and really that's all that we know how to do everything we do is is that um so being agile um and thinking in agile ways is really just taking how we deal with with life and all of its challenges and just applying it to, to other contexts as well and recognizing things are not, not gonna be always how we planned. Um, and on the, the you know, the waterfall, uh, we talked about at the beginning and it came up again at the end. And, and uh, if you look up the original paper about waterfall, um, the reason it is called waterfall is that he was trying to represent, I forget what his name was. Uh, I, I know I have this paper uh, in my, in my uh, files right here, but the reason it's called waterfall is because as he was trying to diagram the process, it wouldn't fit across the page. So he moved them down like this. Hmm. And then on this page with that image that, that inspired the word waterfall, um, he says, uh, and I'll paraphrase, but it's, uh, you know, in theory, this practice, uh, this practice works, but in practice, you must go through it uh, at like at least two times. And so even, uh, even what we think of as waterfall today, the originator of that said, you have to cycle through that process at least, hmm. at least twice. Um, which to me is really an agile way of working. So um, I don't think there is any non-agile way of working. There's just bad ways of applying <laughs> working Man. to the things that we do. <laughs> That's I would uh, add on there. It's a little bit like thinking in, in physical terms between um, rigidness and flexibility. So steel is actually not as hard as stones. Um, However, stone can't bend. Um, what we're always trying to do is come up with a plan so that we have some sort of structure and order in our life, some hope of achieving the goals that we have out there. However, the real world doesn't really know what our plans are, wouldn't care even if it did know, and it's just kind of going to do whatever it's going to do. You can't really live just in a reactive space where it's just like, eh, well, if you're on vacation, I highly encourage you know, not having a plan. It's, go with the flow, but um, you also don't have any perfect plans. Agility is essentially trying to manage the tension between those two things. You want to have some kind of a plan in place so that you have some uh, coherence towards an outcome that you're after. You also need to be uh, constructing this plan in a manner in which it can respond to changes and unpredictable things, including maybe discovering that there's something better out there than what you were pursuing in the first place. That's a good reason, for example, to, to break a sprint. Or if you know, you're a startup, you have this initial idea of what your product is going to be, who the market is that's going to be uh, your, your buyers. And then maybe during the process of working, um, you discover things that would not be possible, sitting back in your armchair and just sort of theorizing about the things. Sometimes you can only find things out by doing. And you discover, hey, there's this other audience that's going to be more passionate about our product. Maybe they'll pay more, maybe they'll pay less, but they're going to be really engaged, whereas the audience you initially thought was going to be yours, there's too much competition or your product isn't really that compelling to them. It was compelling to you because it's your cool idea, um, but you're responding to change still with some kind of structure, but making sure that you didn't make the structure so rigid that when you put pressure on it, it snaps. Steel hmm. is able to bend and still hold together, even though it gets bent. If you made something out of stone, it would just snap and you would no longer have anything there. 
<laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I believe that this is very, very insightful and we appreciate a lot of the both of you, uh, Ed and Brendan. We, we enjoy this conversation a lot. To our audience, it's important. Oh, to don't you say me. Thank Ed. All the work you do with the presentation. <laughs> no, yeah, no. Uh, the, the both of you, it, it was it was great. I mean, like you, I know you meant it. I just meant it. <laughs> yeah, and we will share the recording uh, of this presentation to all of you, so you can also see it uh, more times. And if you would like to share any contact information, uh, guys, please. Uh, we will. Uh, if you're interested in in contacting both of them. Please, uh, we, we can help you with that uh, for sure. We will share the, the information as well with the with the recording. And well, we very much appreciate your time today. We enjoyed this conversation a lot. We will be having another symbiosis event next month. So we're looking forward to seeing you there. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And it's great to oh, having your you. participation as well. Symbiosis, you guys are great. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Ed, everyone. and thank you, Brendan. The recording will be on our YouTube. Somebody asked about their recording. Where can we find it? Uh, we'll have it on our YouTube channel and we'll post it also on our webpage so we can share that through the email you sent on Eventbrite. We'll, we'll reach out to you, okay? Thank you very much, guys, for being here. All right. Thanks. Awesome. You have a good night. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Have a good, good night. Bye-bye. Alrighty, I took some screenshots of the participant list and I'll try to cross correlate those against our signups so I can parse out who attended and who didn't and then we can get you some accurate numbers. Okay, that's perfect. We'll do the same from our side and we'll email that information throughout the week. All right. Data, okay. data. Thank you, Brendan. Have a nice night. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Yeah.